um, for joining us this morning. We're, as Francella um, indicated, we're super excited to have this academic pre-conference. Academic research is very important and it's super important to help inform the policy. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our first presenter today, Mike Conlow. Mike Conlo is a technology strategist for political campaigns and progressive advocacy and nonprofit organizations. He's a passionate advocate for user privacy and open internet. In 2012, Mike was the deputy chief technology officer for the Ob Obama Biden reelection campaign and has held numerous leadership positions in nonprofit data and technology. Today, Mike will talk to us about his research on analyzing broadband adoption using data from the Census American Community Survey. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Uh, and I just wanted to, uh, can you let me share my screen while I do that? But thank you to Next Century Cities for hosting this, a, a group that is so focused on broadband mapping and uh, and just the, the nitty gritty of policy making around this data is just so important. So so thank you for, uh, for hosting this. Um, Lucas, are you gonna share my slides or do you wanna let, let me share? There you go. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about broadband adoption. In particular, I'm gonna talk about using data from the American Community Survey, um, which is really important data about broadband adoption and, and has some tricks to it that, that we can use and, and sometimes are, are used uh, slightly incorrectly that, that I'll talk about. But first, I think everyone is on this call is probably familiar with the FCC's Form 477 data. Um, it is, it, it overstates um, broadband adoption, as, as we all know. If, Lucas, you wanna to move to the next um, slide. And so one location in a census block is served means that the whole block is served as one that we, we well know. A, the, they report the maximum advertised speed, um, which also leads to over-reporting. And so currently with this data, about 3.7% of the population is said to lack access uh, to broadband. And estimates suggest that there's another 3.3 percentage points of people who, uh, who don't have access, even though this data is claiming that, that they do. So overall, it's you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to 10% uh, of the population lacks access to broadband. And we could do a whole nother discussion about, about this data and what that exact number is. Um, still, with this data, you can see why there's such a, a focus on the broadband problem as, as this rural issue. And in, um, in rural areas, access really is lower uh, than in urban and suburban areas. But as this group probably knows, broadband adoption is different than broadband access. And so on the next slide, we, we see the broadband adoption numbers. And so Pew had a recent survey that came out that said 77% of Americans have home broadband, and that's up from 73% in 2019. Uh, and this is the mo kind of most recent national number of, of what broadband adoption uh, is. And it's gonna be important in a minute, so I'll just say it here, that we can probably agree that a cell phone does not count as, as broadband. Pew treats it separately here. Um, and, and yeah, it'll become important. So you know, somebody who has a data cap on their cell phone is probably not getting the most out of, of broadband that, that, that they could. On the next slide, we get into the American Community Survey. So the American Community Survey is a giant survey done by the census. It's done every year. Uh, the last year that is available is 2019, at where, where ACS reports that 70.8% of American households have broadband such as cable, fiber optic, and DSL. Um, and so it, here's the, the exact questions that are used in the ACS. It's questions about uh, the devices that you use, the type of internet connection, and on the next slide is the internet access question. And so they ask four different options, whether you have a cell phone plan, whether you have broadband high speed internet service such as cable fiber optic or DSL, satellite or dial up internet. I think we all probably agree that, that option B there is what we would consider 
fixed high speed terrestrial broadband. It, that's the broadband that we are trying to get to every home uh, in the country. But there's a little bit of a quirk in, in this data. And so if you go to the next slide, which is a screenshot, I'll zoom into it in a second, um, but this is a screenshot from, from how the census actually reports it. You'll see that broadband as we normally define it is actually a nested category inside of broadband of any type. And so broadband of any type as it's defined here is 86% of households, but broadband such as cable fiber or DSL is 70.8%. And it's, it, census is not making this easy on folks because it, they, they keep calling it broadband of any type, but they're including people who checked only the cell phone box on that previous uh, slide that, that had the questions on it. So the next slide kind of zooms in a little bit closer so you can see it, um, but, but there, there it is kind of one of the three options that, that roll up into uh, broadband of any type. So on the next slide, you'll see, I, here's one example of how, of how this gets used, but on the left is a screenshot from the census's own kind of summary of this data. And it, sh it shows, this is a 2018 number, but 85% of people with a broadband subscription. And so numbers like this get used, again, people who are really trying to make a great point, which is that Broadband adoption numbers are lower than we think. It's an, it's an urban and rural problem. And so it, places like the New York Times and NTIA and, and others are, are using this larger broadband adoption number that includes these cell phone only plants. On the next slide, you'll see if we put the FCC's numbers next to the ACS adoption numbers, we see where where the, ur the digital divide is both an urban and rural problem, where that, that comes from. The urban numbers, as we saw before, have great kind of access to broadband, but they only have 65% uh, adoption of broadband. And rural areas, they, they have lower access and they also have low adoption, partly because of access, but also partly because of the same challenges in urban areas that are leading to low adoption, which is, is, is poverty and adoption challenges. Uh, and so this is made possible because the ACS data gives us access to low, to really small geographies down to the block group level, which is really quite small when you aggregate it over a, a five year period. And, and so that's what allows us to do that. And so on the next slide, what we can do with that is really, is really quite, Cool, and so here is an example of a block group that Free Press identified as not, uh, as getting RDOF subsidies in the, the recent FCC auction that probably shouldn't have gotten them. It's a, it's a golf resort in California. And if, but if you look at the data, 86% uh, of households in, in this area ha have broadband in the home, which is way, way, above average and 99% and have access according to the FCC's data, yet it was still eligible for this, this auction. But we can see with this data that almost every home in this neighborhood has broadband already. Uh, if on the next slide, we can see another example of kind of how, how, how this data is different than the ways that the adoption data is, is generally used. And so, on the left is the NTIA indicators of broadband need, areas where 25% or more of households report no internet access. Uh, and this is, this is Philadelphia. And on the right is the same thing using the ACS numbers. 25% or more of households report no high speed broadband such as cable, fiber optic, or DSL. And so you see North Philadelphia and, and West Philadelphia on the left-hand side map, on the right-hand side map, you see uh, even greater areas. It's like everything has expanded. I think it's even more, uh, even more apparent on the next slide, which is New York. And on the left-hand side map, especially if you look in Brooklyn, you see the orthodox areas in, in Brooklyn are 
lit up in red as not having high broadband adoption. If you look on the map on the right, you see kind of what you might expect, which is high poverty areas across all of New York and the surrounding areas uh, do not have, have, have 25% or more of households without, without broadband. Uh, and so, so yeah, those are a couple of examples of how this, how using this particular slice of the data really kind of like changes and emphasizes the, the broadband adoption numbers. And so the, the takeaway here on the next slide is that tw it's 23% of uh, Americans who still don't have broadband. And it, so if you see, this is the kind of thing where now that I have spent time looking closely at this, I, I see this in a lot of places, but other numbers that are not this number or more uh, are, are probably not using the broadband adoption numbers in, in quite the right way. It's both an urban and rural problem, as, as we saw. It's both adoption and, ac and access. And, and obviously, it, this doesn't even get into the, the kind of monopoly problems that we also have, even among people who this data shows uh, are served. So yeah, that, that's it. I'm happy to take questions now. And I think we have time at the end, too. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I do have a few questions for you. Um, first question. So for the first time, the FCC has asked for consumers to provide feedback on their experiences with their broadband service. What do you think the agency can do to ensure that this is a meaningful effort? Yeah, I think that that goes to, you know, the, the data right now says that 25-3 service maximum advertised speed from the carrier counts as broadband. I think that especially in areas that are kind of on the edge where areas that have DSL largely, 20, you're, you're not getting an actual 25.3 in, in those areas. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that with new mapping and with new kind of visibility into what consumers are actually getting that we, we can uh, both increase the 25.3 number but also be honest about what what speeds uh, consumers are getting, especially in some of these kind of like network edge areas that are are largely DSL and are counted as having broadband access with these numbers, but probably are not able to actually use broadband for work and school. And so, do you know that Next Century Cities is composed of over two hundred and thirty members um, from municipalities across the country? Many local leaders have discussed wanting to undertake mapping, mapping efforts, but they often don't know where to start. Do you have any suggestions for how they could go about beginning this process in their communities? Yeah, I, I think that using the data that we have available r right now um, is, is a good place to start, like this ACS uh, data. I, I also think that a big part of what's not known right now is, is these partially served uh, census blocks. It's a there's one person who has service in the whole block, and then they're counting it as served. And the rest of it, they have decided to not bring service to it. And another way of saying this is it's digital redlining. It's it's they have not brought service where it they have not felt a profit motive to to do that. And we have no visibility uh, on that uh, right now. And the FCC is working on this, yes, and they have they have a good plan. It's going to be a complex process. It's going to need local officials are going to need to look very carefully to make sure that it is, it is accurate. But uh, providing visibility on on areas that where ISPs are not providing service, but uh, we don't know about it because the the data doesn't show it at that granularity is is really important to because we're leaving a lot of people. Uh, behind and we have we have no visibility on that and so at a local level I think you could you could show what areas um, are are claimed to have service but in reality don't thank you we do have a question from uh, Peter Carone I hope I pronounced that correctly how will the Biden infrastructure plan improve rural broadband I, well, I, you know, I think that this is a, 
a, a better question for for somebody who is working on on that plan. Uh, you know, my my reading of it is that there is uh, a, a whole bunch of of money that is coming through in the infrastructure bill that is uh, going in in large degree to to rural broadband to access for for rural broadband. I think where the I don't think we know the exact rules in which that money will be distributed right now, um, but I I don't think that anyone has has the view that we're not planning to tackle rural broadband availability with the the vast majority of the the sixty five billion dollars that is being talked about uh, as part of the, the the infrastructure package. So I think that that is the the, the very first thing on everybody's list as we talk about how to divvy up that money is that the rural, the remaining rural broadband availability gap uh, is covered. Thank you. And we do have another question from the chat from Frank Jones. Um, he wants to know, how can someone get this kind of mapping for their communities? Yeah. Um, so all of this data is is public. Um, uh, you know, I won't I won't deny that it, it takes it, it takes a little bit of finessing to to use big data sets like like this. But the the FCC has all of the FCC's uh, form four seven seven data is public. The all the census data is public. There's other data sets out there that are publicly available from um, from UCLA and MLab about the speeds that that um, people experience at, at very granular levels. And so it, it's, it's not as much of a data ac access challenge as it is about kind of using, you, you know, using and combining uh, uh, data sets. And so I would, I, I would urge folks to try to find, um, try to find help with, with using data, but there is a lot of, of good open data that that's, that's out there for folks to use at a local level. Thank you. I just have one last question for you. Um, access to devices is a, is a key facet of broadband adoption. How can we ensure that those who need to get connected are able to access devices as well as a high-speed internet connection? Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely right. And so part of the, the adoption gap that we're seeing you know, it's in a lot of these places. It's it's there is access. Uh, the and then the adoption gap is a is a couple of things. It's cost of of broadband. Uh, it is it's kind of like training and and knowledge and just like the you know the the internet and routers and modems and that kind of stuff being a, a big step for someone who hasn't kind of grown up um, who hasn't grown up with it. And and devices is another is another piece of of that. And so. I, I certainly think that closing the broadband adoption gap, that remaining 23%, um, is going to involve efforts to bring down prices, uh, train people who aren't using the internet to its its full effect, and also providing um, uh, families with devices that they can use for school and work um, so that they can access it once once they have it set up. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Um, we will be circling back around to questions at the latter part of this session. Um, and next we'll have just be talking with Dara Blackwater. Uh, yeah, Dara okay. Blackwater. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I'm gonna introduce you first. Okay, great. Sorry about that delay. Uh, Dara Blackwater is from Farmington, New Mexico and is a citizen of the Navajo Nation. She's a 2020 graduate of the University of Arizona, where she earned her law degree studying indigenous law and telecommunications law. She's currently an indigenous law and policy fellow at the University of Arizona. She interned twice for the Department of the Interior in Washington, DC, under the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs and the Inspector General. She has assisted in building multiple community networks in indigenous communities, and her scholarship focuses on spectrum sovereignty. Nation, Native Nations Inherent Rights to Electromagnetic Spectrum, a Natural Resource. In 2020, she hiked the Colorado Trail 486 miles through Ute homelands to raise awareness about the digital divide in indigenous communities. Dara is an advocate and a creative and can be seen in the upcoming indigenous-led TV series, Reservation Dogs. <laughs> 
Today, she'll elaborate upon her research on the digital divide in indigenous communities and spectrum sovereignty for native nations. Welcome, Dara. Thank you so much, Brittany Ray. Um, I'll do a bit of my own introduction in Diné, uh, Navajo. So, Dara Blackwater Yenishia, Besh Bacha Inishne, Dotsena Jenny Bashishin, Ado Besh Bacha Idashiche, Ado Taj Ini Dashinale. Um, so, my name, as Brittany Ray said, is Dara Blackwater. I'm really, really happy to be here. Very thankful that I was included in this. This is such a, such a cool thing. I had the chance to talk to the panelists yesterday during our prep call, and I'm just so excited to listen to everybody. And um, I'm really excited that Mike went before me because he laid so much foundation that now I don't have to. So thank you so much for that, Mike. I really appreciate it. Um, as Brittany Ray said, I'm from Farmington, New Mexico. I'm back there now visiting my parents. I'm in their utility closet because it's the quietest place in the house. Um, and I grew up here. I went to Farmington High School. I went, I graduated from Fort Lewis College, which is um, a tribal school just 45 minutes north of here in Durango, Colorado. Um, after Fort Lewis, I took time off from school and I worked for, um, a, uh, I took care of elders in Durango um, for a home care company. I then went to China and, or maybe that was flipped. I don't remember now. Um, I went to China and I was a tennis pro. And then I did some um, human outreach work there. I walked a ridiculous way in China to um, 1400 miles to raise money for an orphanage there with another woman. And uh and then I came back and I worked for the Navajo Nation. I wanted to come home and I worked, I did an AmeriCorps grant um, and we were doing lots of different teen outreach stuff, nutrition education. And I really got to know my community and the Navajo Nation in a way that I hadn't before. Because for those of you who don't know, Farmington is a border town. So we're very close to the Navajo Nation, but we're not on the reservation. And I would say that's reflective of sort of my life as a whole. My dad is Diné, my mom is Anglo, German and Dutch. Um, and so growing up in a border town is very representative of that, uh, just that upbringing as well. So after I came home from China, worked on the Navajo Nation, um, I then I was going to go to school for my master's of social work. Um, and I had been accepted to UC Berkeley, which they have a great program. Um, but I... I was just, as I was working on the Navajo Nation, I realized that I wanted to be able to make an impact at a higher level than working on the ground, um, which I love working on the ground and no disrespect to social workers because social workers keep this world turning, I swear. Um, but I wanted to really be able to influence policy. And I learned that when I was working on the Navajo Nation. And um, a lot of how I came to that, honestly, was working at a teen outreach program, and we had to teach abstinence-only sex education. And that really bothered me because empirically that's not chosen or that's not shown to work at all. And um, so I knew that I wanted to go to law school so that I could actually influence how these dollars are used, influence um, what's attached to them so that we could implement programs for our people that worked for us. And so that's really what took me to law school. And once I got to law school, as Brittany Ray said, um, I went out to Washington, DC. I interned at the Department, Department of Interior and for the Inspector General. And while I was at DOI, I was the youngest person. I was an unpaid intern. And they said, we don't know what to do with this digital divide thing. Um, you go figure it out, come back and tell us what's going on. So um, I went out all over DC. I went to the Capitol building. I went to the White House. I went to the penthouse of DOI. Um, it was Ryan Zinke who was in charge at the time. And um, I just listened. And what I learned was, um, you know, a lot of it, as Mike was saying, is data that isn't correct. A lot of it is um, infrastructure dollars not going to the places that they need to go. And a lot of it, um, as I kept digging and kept digging, is spectrum, access to spectrum rights. And so that is kind of the thing that I've taken up um, in my research. And I have written about the digital divide generally, but specifically about spectrum rights. And so um, of you who don't know, 
electromagnetic spectrum, spectrum for short, is essentially, you can think about the radio waves that are going through the air, um, and it's what is necessary for any wireless communication. So um, it's not something that is made by any telecom company or the government or any person. It's just a naturally occurring wave on the land and that is why I call it a natural resource, because as I started to understand spectrum and look at it through my world's view, which is heavily influenced by my Diné, um, you know, upbringing in this area, I started to understand, like, this is somebody that we know. I've heard elders, <laughs> I've heard elders call, um, you know, rate uh, anything in the computer world or the radio world um, that that person thunder the thunder beings, and so there is this indigenous world view that um, understands spectrum, understands the way that um, we communicate through waves. You know, it's not uncommon um, or it's not foreign to us that um, bats communicate through waves, that whales communicate through waves, and so for us to be able to communicate through electromagnetic spectrum is not something that's like absolutely wild to indigenous peoples. It's something something that we know and something we're familiar with. And so um, this natural resource spectrum is extremely valuable, um, not just in a monetary way. Um, obviously, we can utilize it to connect our citizens. And as we saw last year, that is so, so important. We're talking not just education and the kids who need to do distance learning. We're talking about telehealth. And um, we're talking about, you know, not ex not being exposed, um, protecting our elders from going into a clinic where they may be, uh, where they where there may be a lot of coronavirus happening. And so, um, telehealth, economic development, these are all the most important aspects of tribal sovereignty. And again, for those who aren't familiar, tribal sovereignty is this, this idea that these tribes, these native nations in that are now within present day America, um, we've been around for thousands and thousands of years, and we've been governing ourselves for thousands and thousands of years. And so to now be under this kind of American system, we're having to learn how to navigate what this looks like when we've been self-governing for so long. And now we're working with this other government. And so, um, the executive order 13175 is was passed originally by Bill Clinton but then it was reaffirmed by um President Biden earlier 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 this year last year sorry recently um and that is essentially just strengthening and affirming our government to government relationships there are 574 federally recognized tribes within America. And there are even more that aren't recognized by the federal government. There are even more that are recognized by the state. There are even more that kind of fit into their own category. And um, so these, these native nations have been governing themselves for a very long time, and that's what they intend to keep doing. So when we talk about sovereignty and how education and healthcare and economic development are such an important part of that, we're talking about the, the means to determine what we want to do with ourselves, the means to um, you know, take all of these tools and point ourselves in the right direction and have the tools that we need in order to go that way, in order to um, teach our children what we want to teach them, in order to teach them in a way that we want to teach them and at the time we want to teach them. And so a lot of my scholarship and a lot of my arguments say that spectrum is absolutely imperative to sovereignty and to that self-determination because we have to be able to connect in this day and age. We have to be able to connect those kids. We have to be able to connect our elders. We have to be have the opportunity to um, be together when we can't be together like last year, which absolutely in such a rural place and in urban areas, there's a lot of tribes in urban areas as well. Um, it, it's imperative to have spectrum for all of that. Um, so just like when um, I was so frustrated that the those dollars, sorry, I didn't finish that story, for the um, sex education, I was out in Denahotso, Arizona, which is a couple hours from Farmington, and we would drive out there a couple times a week to go educate these kids on a wide array of things. Sorry, there's a plane going by. Um, and when I asked why we had to do abstinence only education, the answer that I got was it was because it, they were state funds, state of Arizona funds. And it was mandatory that we had to teach it that way because 
um, the state said so. And that really bothered me because it was people in Phoenix, um, probably with a white Christian worldview, telling us in Denahotso at a BIA school how we were supposed to educate our children. And I've listened to elders talk about, um, you know, talk about sex and talk about the the creation stories and talk about our stories of, you know, a lot of it is storytelling of somebody who was told something and didn't listen and and then they suffered the consequences. And that's how we learn and that's how we educate. And for that to be stripped away from us and set to, um, for legislators to say, no, you have to do it this way. I mean, that is the ongoing harm of colonization in a nutshell. And so um, Franchella yesterday really pushed me to really outline how people can actually help and what are the things that we can do to, um, to make the digital divide better in indigenous communities. And there are a couple things. I'm going to share my screen if I can. Um, one of them is to, let's see how this is going to go. Yeah, I'll just leave it like that. So oh, actually, I think I can. So this last one is what I kind of want to focus on here. Let create grants. If you're creating state grants um, or federal grants, create grants that allow tribal leaders to use their judgment about what is good for their citizens and their communities. Don't dictate, don't, don't push your worldview that is not an indigenous worldview on how those dollars are supposed to be spent. Um, as Mike said, uh, report accurate data and ask tribal leadership for confirmation. Tribal leaders are the best ones to tell you what kind of connectivity they have on their lands. The GAO report, Government Accountability Office, said that we're at 35% of people on rural tribal lands that don't have connectivity. So that number is probably even higher. As Mike said, um, our data is not even accurate a lot of the time. And so tribal leaders are the ones who know what how connected their reservations are. Um, this one is realize the difference between connecting tribal lands, which is reservations, and indigenous communities communities or citizens within your area. So a lot of native people don't live on reservations, but they're still dealing with that intergenerational trauma where they might need telehealth and mental health appointments. They're still dealing with poverty and not being able to afford internet or not being able to afford the hardware to connect. Um, this one is controversial. Donate new or refurbished laptops to tribal schools. I think a lot of tribes would say, we've got it. Uh, you don't have to donate. We don't want your used stuff. But at the same time, chapter houses, retirement homes, some schools are wanting um, laptops and wanting iPads and whatnot. And the, the funding mechanism is not there. So um, just at least ask. And if they say no, then that's OK. And then this is a big one. Recently, state leaders were given the authority to license and sell 4.9 gigahertz spectrum licenses and that you can recognize tribal spectrum sovereignty. Um, and that is something that the federal government is not doing, but that doesn't mean that the state government can't do it. So um, that is pretty much the end of it. I think I have a few minutes for Q&A. And uh, yeah, I'll leave time for that. Thank you so much, Dara. Uh, yes, we do have a couple of questions for you. Um, so then thank you again for sharing those resources. That was really helpful for outlining how to be a, an ally. But given that the FCC has been focusing on opening up more spectrum to tribal nations to increase connectivity, are these meaningful steps forward or are there other steps that the FCC could take to accelerate broadband access? Um, that's a great question. It's... Um... I, I think it depends on who you ask, and you're asking one of the most outspoken advocates for spectrum sovereignty in the country at this moment. So um, a lot of maybe some tribal leaders would say, yeah, this is enough, and we're able to connect, and, and that's, uh, that's a huge step forward, which I agree with, and it's enough. Um, I, my take on spectrum sovereignty is that um, like I said, it's a natural resource. We as tribes have had to fight tooth and nail for every other natural resource that we have been able to reclaim from the federal government. Land, um, and we haven't been able to reclaim a lot of that yet, um, but land, coal, oil, and gas, 
water. These are all things that are heavily litigated by native nations because they've been taken from us and we have to litigate to get to even try to get a tiny bit of them back. And so we're seeing a similar pattern with spectrum where um, in 1993, Congress authorized the FCC to start um, auctioning off spectrum. And since then, um, up in, by December 2019, the FCC collected $117 billion from spectrum auctions. So it's really Native nations being disenfranchised twice. Um, one, that they can't utilize that spectrum that's being sold out from under them because it's now going to third parties, so they can't connect their citizens. And two, they're not benefiting economically from those spectrum auctions. That money is going into U.S. Treasury. It's not going into trust for the tribes, even if it's being sold near or on their lands or in an area where they could serve their citizens. So it's really the 2.5 gigahertz spectrum window that the FCC opened up was great. And I celebrate that. And I think it's awesome. And um, to me, it's sort of like taking a cookie away and saying, well, you can apply to get one crumb back. And so it's a little bit of a slap in the face in my view, but there could be, I'm sure there's a lot of native people and a lot of native leaders that might disagree with me. So um, that is sort of uh, my take on spectrum sovereignty. Thank you. And we do have time for one last question, but for those of y'all that are submitting questions in the chat, do know that we are gonna circle back around and have some more question time. Um, if your question doesn't get answered this time around. Um, often tribal connectivity issues are treated as separate from broadband programs for the general public. Is that a helpful distinction when many indigenous residents may not live on tribal lands? Will you read the first part of that again? Sure. Often tribal connectivity issues are treated as separate from broadband programs for the general public. Is that a helpful distinction when many indigenous residents may not live on tribal lands? That's a really interesting question. I. I don't know. I think in some ways it might be a, it might be helpful because um, tribal broadband does have different considerations than rural or urban. Um, in that, you know, sometimes it's harder to get rights of way because there's more red tape and you have to get things approved by the BIA, so projects can be harder to implement. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, I would I, I am hesitant to say that a distinction is. A good thing because a lot of times the distinctions uh, result in us getting uh, worse health care or worse education. And so I'm not actually sure how that plays out in all the different scenarios. It could be helpful in some, some instances and, and it could hold us back in others. Well, thank you so much for your perspective and your presentation. We are going to move on to Dr. Colin Rhinesmith. Uh, Dr. Colin Rhinesmith is an associate professor and director of the Community Informatics Lab in the Simmons University School of Library and Information Science. He's also a senior faculty research fellow with the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society. Rhinesmith's research is focused on the social, community, and policy aspects of information and communication technology, particularly in areas related to digital inclusion and broadband adoption. He is affiliated with the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry as a member of its Scholars Council. Previously, he was a Google Policy Fellow as, and an Adjunct Research Fellow with the New America Open Technology Institute and a Faculty Research Fellow with the Benton Foundation. He was also a Faculty Associate with the Berkman Klein Center for the Internet and Society at Harvard University. Brian Smith received his PhD in Library and Information Science from the Graduate School of Library and Information Science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he was an Institute of Museum and Library Services funded Information and Society Fellow, a researcher with the Center for People and Infrastructures, and a research scholar with the Center for Digital Inclusion. Today, Dr. Ryan Smith will shed light on his research on digital equity ecosystems and the importance of community level studies. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brittany Ray, and um, it's been, uh, and thank you also to Next Century Cities. This is really such a wonderful um, gathering. Um, thank you to Mike, to Dara, uh, Brian, and Dominique for um, being part of this as well. It's really just a fantastic opportunity to be with you all. Um, so uh, let's see, next slide, please. All right, so, um, and is it possible to have the full screen view on the slides? That would be fantastic if possible. Um, so what I want to uh, essentially try to convince you all of today 
is the importance of digital equity ecosystems. Now, the reason why I'm beginning with this slide of a mangrove forest ecosystem in Okinawa, Japan, is to help us visualize um, what might be understood as a problem, uh, which is, say, an individual's lack of access to broadband technology, in some cases devices, digital literacy training, and to look more broadly at what is actually happening in many cities across the country around digital inclusion. Now, what I mean by that is if we look only at an individual mangrove, mangrove tree, as well as its roots that are planted deeply into, um, into the ground, uh, we think about an individual who does not have access, a family that does not have access, if we're only thinking of what we might refer to as a deficit-based perspective in digital inclusion work, then we miss all of the community supports, the other environmental factors, the social factors, the political, the economic factors that are actually a huge part of doing this work in communities across the country. And so um, where did I get this from? Why, why, are, why do I think it's important to think in this way? If we can move to the next slide. That really from back in 2015 when I started this research looking at ecosystems, community-based supports and solutions to promote digital equity in communities across the United States, this was an example that was presented to me. This is the Kansas City Coalition for Digital Inclusion that still exists today. And this is actually a self-represented map of all of the assets that exist, existed at the time in Kansas City, that all played a role in supporting people's access to technology, their ability to adopt broadband and computers in ways that were relevant and meaningful to them in their everyday lives. You can see just from the number of different entities, both internal, to Kansas City, as well as outside at the state, the federal level, that all played a role in supporting the work of the Kansas City Coalition for Digital Inclusion, as well as for, and if you uh, can move to the next slide, please, Lucas, thank you, to an individual level. So this slide essentially represents meaningful broadband adoption. This is a phrase that we, uh, and, and actually a number of other scholars uh, in the field at the time, uh, help to sort of flesh out to really paint a broader picture of all of the entities that are involved oftentimes in support. It takes a village, right? That's the sort of what I'm talking about here. In the center of this image, you see the individual or family. And around the individual or family, you see healthcare organizations, local governments, internet service providers, li library schools, and digital inclusion organizations that also play a role in this process. So this is one way, what we call the networked model of meaningful broadband adoption. Now, really what we wanna look at because of the development, the increasing numbers of digital inclusion coalitions like the Kansas City Coalition for Digital Inclusion that have emerged over the years since 2015. Uh, next slide, please. So really what I want to do today in the remaining time that I have is share some recent research uh, with you from that was published in a report by the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society where I'm affiliated uh, in this report here called uh, Growing Healthy Digital Equity Ecosystems During COVID-19 and Beyond. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, what do we mean by digital equity ecosystems? Here's a definition, it's a little bit long, um, but I think it really encapsulates the importance of moving towards an ecosystems approach to promoting digital equity. So here I'll just read that, uh, it says here that digital equity ecosystems are understood as interactions between individuals, populations, communities, and their larger, what I've called socio-technical environments, and that sounds very academic, but I'll, I'll tell you what that means in a minute, that all play a role in shaping the digital inclusion work in local communities to promote more equitable access to technology and social and racial justice. And I'll also talk about why that's an important lens as well. So briefly by socio-technical, there's, there's a, a recognition that when we're working to provide access to technology, 
that technology cannot be separated from its social aspects, okay? And so we have to understand that technology is shaped by social, cultural, political, and economic factors that play a role in ultimately people's adoption or not, or non-adoption of a particular technology. But also the social and racial justice aspects are incredibly important in understanding the fact that when we talk about the digital divide and promoting digital equity, particularly in historically marginalized communities, that's a social justice issue. That's an issue that oftentimes then reminds us it's not just about equal distribution of technology, it's about recognizing historical disenfranchisement that has led to people's inability to access technology. So an ecosystems approach is really an attempt to take a holistic look and to make the issue intentionally more complicated, not just because I'm an academic and I'm good at that, but um, because oftentimes it sheds a light on what we can do and the actions we can take to address these larger systemic problems. Next slide, please. So um, what I'll do briefly is just go through a few of the um, findings from the study that we did. Um, there's a link to the report in the, um, thank you Francella for sharing the link to the report, which you can go and look at. But I'll just provide a brief um, overview of what we, uh, what we did and what we learned uh, and how that might be helpful for your own work in this space. So essentially the survey was uh, really targeted uh, National Digital Inclusion Alliance members. This is an organization that I've been a part of for many years and represents many of the folks on the ground, practitioners who are working in communities, public libraries, schools, other nonprofit organizations, but also policymakers, also um, other folks uh, and researchers like myself and folks on this call. So during one week at the end of August and early September in 2020, uh, we sent out a survey. This was with my co-author and colleague Susan Kennedy, who's a co-author on the report. Uh, 55 individuals completed the survey that uh, identified as being part of NDIA. Uh, but in the end, we actually only included 36 responses because these are the folks that really identified as being part of either formal informal or emerging digital inclusion coalitions in their communities. <clears throat> and that was really the goal of the report, to understand what coalitions and alliances, folks who are organized in their communities for digital equity, how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted their work, as well as what are some things that they might actually do once the pandemic is over because of those constraints. And that's really what we were interested in. So next slide, please. So here's just a brief overview map of the survey participants who participated in the study. It was really a nice representation both of NDIA members and folks who participated in the study. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is hard to read and the next few slides might be difficult, so I'll just quickly summarize some of the slides here. So um, these are uh, representations of the populations that the organizations themselves served. So the people who responded to the survey, uh, the organizations that they're a part of, uh, who they serve. Uh, we can see low-income folks, uh, ethnic or racial minority, uh, adults among different age groups, and urban populations among the top groups. Uh, next slide, please. So this is probably one of the more important slides that we want to um, uh, let you know about at this point. These are really the, the activities that organizations are doing in their communities around the country. Some of you, I'm sure, on this call are involved in this work. So what are they providing free or low-cost internet access? Number two, providing digital literacy training. Number three, low-cost broadband-enabled devices. And number four, public access computing facilities. Even after folks have computers, uh, they have internet access and digital literacy training, it turns out that people still need places to go where they can gain support, like public libraries. Next slide, please. Uh, and ultimately, we're, we're focused on digital inclusion alliances and coalitions. This is just a snapshot of the website of the San Antonio Digital Inclusion Alliance. Next slide, next slide please. Uh, 
Um, some of the partners involved in their coalition you can see are broken down here and you can find in the report. So local nonprofits, local governments, workforce development, libraries. Um, next slide, please. Uh, also, we have a nice breakdown of how long folks have worked, uh, how long their group has been together, and whether they formed in response to COVID-19 or whether they had been together before COVID-19. Next slide, please. And actually, if you can just move forward since we're running low on time, uh, one more uh, slide ahead. Fantastic, key findings. All right, so thank you so much, Luca. So in the time we have left here, so um, this also gets down, to these final um, uh, slides really talk about the work going on and how folks uh, that are part of this uh, meeting today, if you're looking for ways to get involved in supporting folks in your community doing this work, um, th these are some of the takeaways. So a lot of coalitions that were established before the pandemic responded to COVID-19 by focusing their efforts on information and resource sharing, networking, data collection, raising awareness about digital inequality, and developing new tactics. So things that were sort of beyond some of the basic sort of providing access to devices and digital literacy training. Uh, we're doing new things that I think are, would be helpful if you take a look in the report. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and actually, if you can go, because we only have a couple minutes left, um, next slide, next slide, and the last slide, there we go. Okay, and then um, one of the things that was also, I think, important to, th to um, highlight because of the ecosystems approach, that statewide and multi-state coalitions, as well as national organizations, are often part of this work, right? So what we found is when we asked what they were doing, folks were saying that they're providing maps of free internet locations, compiling lists of low cost internet deals, providing recommendations for COVID-19 task forces, so on and so forth. So I think what the report you'll find when looking at it is just the, just the richness and the breadth of work going on in communities across the country, during COVID-19, but also before and, you know, really right up until the present, just such a diversity of work and people and groups that are really, um, you know, it's there's almost something for everyone. If there's a way that you want to get involved in this work, there's uh, many ways to do that. And then if the last slide, please. All right, so what I really hope today is that I convinced you that moving towards an ecosystems approach is, uh, is a good way to shift your thinking about digital equity and digital inclusion work. And really to think about, I think most importantly, to go back to this um, image of the roots in the ground that we can really, if we really want to do this work in a long-term, sustainable, meaningful way, we really have to look at the underlying root causes of the digital divide in order to disrupt them and to move communities forward to the really, the healthy spaces that we're really hoping that the, where this work goes to. So with that, um, I will stop there and happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ryan Smith. Um, Leslie Scott does have a question from the chat. She wants to know, or he, um, or they, wants to know what is an example of other activities that you mentioned in your pie chart in your presentation? You know, I knew that someone was going to ask this question, <laughs> and I did not have time to go back through the survey data and actually pull it out, and I knew I should have. So, Leslie, I am happy to um, follow up with you and let you know, because I do have an answer, but I don't have it handy. Sorry about that. That's no problem. We'll collect their information and make sure that you can email them directly. Thank you. Um, so in your piece published with Benton, you mentioned how communities without broadband offices can pursue digital inclusion plans through other offices. Can you talk about the importance of whole government cooperation when developing and implementing these plans? Yeah, so if you're talking about digital equity plans in cities, Yes, absolutely. So, um, so that is an area that is really one of the areas of work that's needed that we that came up again in this in this digital equity ecosystems report that many communities that were working on um, 
to digital inclusion in their communities during COVID said that they either had a, a digital inclusion plan or their work or they were working towards one. And I think it's absolutely critical, um, myself being part of work here in the city of Boston, working with the digital uh, equity um, uh, fund at the city of Boston, that we know that local leadership is and local municipal, local government support is is absolutely vital and essential and to have a position funded within local government to support and lead in this way is absolutely crucial. Um, it's actually, and what the way to think about it is it's one less step towards getting to um, achievable goals that are that I tried to map out today. There's so much work to do that it actually becomes an obstacle to this work in a look in a municipality, not having someone in the local leadership level representing local government because there's so many things that have to go through local government to get things done. And so and to be coordinated in that way, whether it's coordinating between different agencies and different if it's a larger city um, or it's just showing leadership, showing leadership that you know we care about this in our community and we're taking action steps to move it forward um, you need a, a person a champion in local government really to lead this work thank you we just have one last question for you again if you have additional questions for the panelists they are able to answer questions a little bit later in our presentation um, you touched on this in your presentation, but what are some of the root causes that have led to digital equity challenges? Absolutely. Um, I'm actually starting a new project on digital equity ecosystems, working with a number of communities and having folks share their own stories about what they believe to be the root causes of the digital divide. But we do know that all of the academic studies show that the digital divide is further deepened by, by racial ethnic lines. We know that folks who are not, you know, quite frankly, like me, who are white, well-educated, um, and in, you know, have good paying jobs are, you know, I don't have to worry about internet access. But when we look at race, income, education, we find that those are larger factors. We know this, many people on the call know this. So if we think about other inequalities, historically, Marginalized, mar marginalized communities, I think one of the things that's been helpful recently is a conversation about digital redlining. But it maybe folks then learn about redlining, right, and the history of redlining. So there is a lot for us to learn. There are a lot of conversations we need to have about and with our communities, particularly those on, you know, quote unquote, the wrong side of the digital divide, to understand in each part of the country where there has been historically marginalization that impacts the digital divide um, very clearly. So there's a lot of research to look at. There's a lot of um, really important young scholars that are coming into this field right now who are helping us to learn more about where this is coming from. But I think it's really a key part of the work ahead that we need to do. And thank you so much for your informative presentation. Um, we will be moving right along to Dr. Brian Whitaker. Uh, Dr. Whitaker is a professor and John and P Patsy Newt's chair in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Oklahoma State University. His main area of interest is rural economic development with the focus on the role that technology can play. He has published over 60 peer-reviewed journal articles with mo most exploring the relationship between internet access and rural development. He has developed innovative outreach programs that help small towns benefit from the internet. Brian has won regional and national awards for his research, teaching, and outreach programs. Dr. Whitaker will discuss his research on distinct differences between broadband availability and adoption in rural and urban areas, highlighting recent legislation and rural broadband experiences exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, such as the homework gap and telehealth challenges faced by rural communities. Thank you so much for being here today. Welcome. Well, thank you, Brittany Ray, and I appreciate the opportunity to share some of my research along with uh, these other outstanding uh, presenters. I learned a lot from uh, Mike and Dara's presentation, and I've actually worked with Colin before. He was a, a digital inclusion advocate long before COVID-19, so it's great to, to hear some of the, his more recent work, and uh, hopefully I can, can contribute to this uh, a little bit as well. Um, so as Brittany Ray said, I'm, a, I'm in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Oklahoma State University. 
And um, some of you might be saying, why is an ag economist talking on this next century cities presentation? And the reason is I mostly focus on rural economic development. So there's a lot of things that play into that, but one that is particularly relevant is broadband access. I do quite a bit of work on what broadband access can mean for rural communities, and we'll, we'll see some of that uh, as I get, go through my presentation. Um, but what I'm going to highlight here today is actually a, a forthcoming article on our, our Choices publication, which is a, a, a kind of popular press publication by the Agricultural and Applied Economics Association. And what that means is there's no fancy formulas, uh, so you guys don't have to worry about all the uh, crazy math that economists like to do sometimes. It's, it's uh, much more of a, a watered-down version of uh, the more relevant issues for a, a general audience. Um, so next slide, please. Um, I don't think I have to tell anyone on this presentation, uh, make an argument for why broadband is important. Um, you know, five or 10 years ago, we were really trying to get this message across to a, a large array of policymakers. Uh, COVID-19 made it pretty clear. Uh, pretty much everybody on this call uses the broad, uses a broadband connection for a whole host of things that you do online. You can see up there, you know, connecting through Facebook, applying for jobs, paying your bills. Uh, most of us basically use the internet multiple times every day. Uh, and it is true that those without a connection are being left further behind. And so I've highlighted some uh, he uh, headlines from, from major popular press outlets. You can see it's COVID-19 has widened the homework gap. Uh, the big winners under COVID-19 are broadband access and telehealth. Um, new urgency for rural broadband access. Uh, you can see a survey result over there conducted by Pew that uh, basically 90% of U.S. adults said it's either essential or uh, important uh, during the, the, the COVID uh, outbreak. So clearly this is a, an important topic and I'm gonna come at it from a rural urban perspective, again, focusing on uh, those rural populations and, and what uh, they experienced during uh, prior to and during COVID-19. So next slide. Um, so here's some, some of the research that I mentioned. Uh, it's pretty clear right now uh, that a lot of studies show, yes, broadband does matter for uh, rural quality of life, a whole host of issues. Um, some of my own research has shown that it's important for rural housing values. It contributes to entrepreneurship levels, to job creation, to uh, civic engagement. Uh, there's a whole host there. If you guys are, if you want fancy formulas, these are the, the titles to look up uh, and, and dig into some of that research. Um, you can also see at the top there, I, I posted an old school uh, non-broadband connection for those of you who remember a 56K modem. I play that sound for my students now and they don't know what to make of that dial-up uh, connection. Um, so what I'm going to do in this presentation is to quickly review the rural-urban differences prior to COVID-19. And I am going to draw on some of that data that Mike highlighted about uh, the difference between access and adoption. I'm glad he was able to, to make that point very clearly. I am going to talk about some of the broadband related legislation that was passed, uh, specifically the first two stimulus uh, packages that were passed, and then highlight some rural experiences with a couple of important components, the, the homework gap and telehealth. Uh, so next slide. So here is the uh, rural urban differences in broadband availability over the years. And these are pulled directly from the FCC reports, this form 477 reports, and you can see the percentage there on the left, the percentage of urban households that have a 25-3 uh, connection is pretty high, and it's been universally high for, since 2014. It's up to almost 99% of the urban population. We do see a ramping up of the rural population, uh, but clearly a, a gap between availability in rural and urban areas. If I were to put the tribal numbers on here to, to speak to Dara's portion, they would be even lower than that rural number. Um, and but what you can see is there's still an even larger gap for these higher speed connections on the right. You can see the, the 250 megabits down and 25 up. We're up to about 95 percent of urban populations with that kind of access, but only about half of rural have those faster speeds, which we've seen are more important for things like Zoom calls and, and con, you know, conference call participation and uploading large, large amounts of data. So we're, we're seeing a trend towards these faster connections. Uh, so that's the availability side. Uh, next slide. 
Um, so to Mike's point, this is, there's definitely a difference between availability and adoption. And I should caveat, this is probably using any kind of internet connection. So Mike's point about, uh, you know, this probably does include mobile connections is, is well taken. But again, the point is you see a distinct gap between rural and urban areas, about five to 10 percentage point lower in rural areas leading up to the pandemic. So basically the idea is going into the pandemic, um, rural areas were already disadvantaged in terms of both availability and adoption. Uh, next slide. When we start talking about what the federal government has done about this, most of their funding up to COVID-19 was nearly universally focused on the availability side of the coin. So if you remember the uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act era, they spent over $7 billion on broadband and only about 3% of it was focused on adoption. Um, all these other connection programs that we have, the FCC's Connect America Fund, USDA Reconnect, and some of these other broadband grant and loans programs were really focused on availability. There was very little focused on adoption. And the few studies that we have on those adoption efforts don't show much of an impact. We, we don't really know how to move the needle yet in terms of adoption. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So next slide. So the first main point I make in this paper is that COVID-19 did move the needle in terms of what the funding is going to. Prior to COVID-19, almost all focused on availability. Now we did see some funding going towards promoting adoption. So you can see the CARES Act that was passed in March 2020. A lot of the formula funding that went out uh, went to support online learning. So giving hotspots to schools and students that they didn't have a connection at home. Um, we also saw some digital inclusion grants to the IMLS under that first round of funding. And then, of course, we had the emergency broadband benefit as part of the later uh, uh, act, the Consolidated, Consolidated Appropriations Act in December. Um, this article does not talk about the American Rescue Plan Act, which is followed in March of 2021. But again, the idea is the same. There's, there is still going to be uh, more money focused on adoption uh, under these new packages as well. So next slide, please. So I wanna talk about what, what happened uh, during this time. So this is pulled from some US Census uh, Household Pulse surveys that were done during the pandemic. They did these about every two weeks. And they actually asked these questions of all, of, of every state. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't break it out by rural or urban status. And these charts I wanna look at show internet availability for households that had a student in them, a K through 12 student, and also computer availability. And what the charts show is that it does look like we were able to make some kind of an impact in terms of computer availability, but not really in terms of internet availability. So you see a, a dip there during the summer months, but then we went up from 70 to 70, 70 percent to 77% for computer availability, but we stayed pretty, pretty consistent at this 72% internet availability over time. So it doesn't look like all this funding that went to schools uh, to try to give them connectivity really had much of an impact. And the next slide shows that a little bit clearer. We see um, the percentage of households that got their computer or internet access from schools. A large percentage got their computers from schools. Very few got their internet access from schools. So that's one takeaway is that it's not easy to, uh, to quickly improve the internet connectivity situation in, in uh, places that, that lack them. Um, so that's a kind of the main takeaway here for the homework gap. Um, next slide, please. Um, I also want to talk about telehealth. We don't have a lot of data yet on telehealth use during the pandemic. Of course, a lot of hospitals shut down, physician offices shut down. We were only able to see a doctor via telehealth for a, a lot of the that mid part of, of early 2020, you know, the April or May timeframe. And unfortunately, this is not labeled, but those the uh, top bar there is for urban areas and the lower bar is for rural. And so that you can see in about mid 2020, when telehealth use really spiked, um, we started to see that urban rates of telehealth use were about 50%, and that was only about half, only about 25% in, in more rural areas. Um, we also did see that some funding that went to telehealth during this time did allow for um, payment of connected devices, so things like smartphones and monitors that people use to, to um, take advantage of telehealth. But, and I think this speaks to Colin's point, if they're going to pay for those, they're kind of assuming that the population knows how to use them and, and get in touch with a, uh, a health professional via telehealth, which is not 
always an easy thing to do. So this is a, another reason why the digital inclusion effort should be funded uh, in the future. Um, next slide. So I just have a couple more slides to, to kind of finish things up. Um, I want to mention a couple of other potential impacts to, to rural areas that I did not touch on in this article, but are certainly relevant for this discussion. Um, one is teleworking. So the idea that we know rural places typically have worse broadband availability, but those that had better broadband availability, were they more resilient during the coronavirus? Did they experience lower unemployment rates? I know there's some ongoing research into this. Um, we, we think, we hypothesize that they did fare better because of this better broadband access. It has yet to be kind of, kind of turned up. Um, we think that, uh, you know, there, we, we saw people leaving these dense urban areas during COVID-19 and potentially post-COVID-19. Uh, we're, we're wondering what the impact of, of broadband, of good broadband availability is on these migration decisions. And then certainly, Agriculture is an important uh, topic for rural areas. We do know that there's an increasing trend towards precision ag that does require broadband availability. That's things like mapping your yields and how much fertilizer you apply to each, each plot of land. The FCC did uh, form this precision ag connectivity task force that's looking at this issue. I should say that the, the Form 477 data does not consider agricultural land at all. It only looks at households or, or, um, or population. And so this is something that's not very well captured by the, the current uh, broadband availability data. And we're trying to do some work on this as well, but these are all other uh, topics that are important for rural areas that were not really addressed by uh, this current study. And so I think I've got one more slide just to kind of to finish things up. So going into the pandemic, we know rural residents were already disadvantaged with lower broadband, both availability and adoption. Um, I do argue that the COVID-19 stimulus package moved the bar forward uh, on broadband policy, and particularly moving a little bit away from simple uh, availability and realizing that digital inclusion is an important thing to fund. Uh, the, addressing that cost aspect is an important thing to fund. We've got these $50 monthly subsidies going out to, to uh, eligible households as part of the emergency broadband benefit. And um, uh, my argument is that what we, what we see from these policies is that it's not easy to, to address the digital divide in the short term because they didn't have a meaningful impact on things like uh, the, the homework gap and telehealth ability during that short turnaround time uh, of the, uh, you know, the, the later months in 2020. So uh, I think that's it for, for my presentation. I'm happy to, to take some questions that you all might have about um, about specific policies uh, focusing on, on rural broadband access. Uh, I do a lot, of, a lot of work on this topic and I'm happy to, to hear from colleagues who might be interested in it as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Whitaker. I do have a few questions for you. Um, in last year's report published in October, 2020, State Broadband Policy Impacts on Availability, um, you highlighted the ways that flaws in federal data sets pose difficulties to your analysis. If better data were available, how would that impact and improve your uh, ability to analyze policy? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. And I should say we are making steps towards better data being available. Uh, some of you might have heard of this broadband serviceable location fabric that is going to be required of all providers by the um, or of all states uh, in upcoming versions of the broadband data. We actually have our hands on that for Oklahoma, and we're trying to, to do some mapping with it and, and figure out what it's going to mean for future iterations of this. The idea is that we can now, we're gonna have latitude and longitude of every single household and every single business and even agricultural oriented buildings and things like that. And we can actually go in and uh, overlay that with the shape files that are going to need to be provided by the providers. And we'll have a much more accurate picture of what actually um, is available and which buildings are, are served and not served. So I think we're moving in the right direction. Unfortunately, it's going to take a while before all providers actually give us shape files as opposed to just listing the census blocks that they served, which we've already highlighted is a big, uh, a big problem. Uh, I think that will have meaningful ramifications for policy because we can more accurately depict the exact number of, of buildings and households and businesses that don't have a, a broadband provider. 
thank you. Um, we have, oh, sorry. We have a question. <laughs> Oops, we have a question from Leslie Scott. Um, she, Leslie says they're seeing a lot of activity from university extension offices. What role do you think that university extension offices can play or are currently playing? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Leslie. Thank you. Um, I, so speaking for myself here in Oklahoma, I'm a big proponent of getting our county extension offices uh, involved in sending out the message about the emergency broadband benefit. So we're trying to get that message out there for people who, are, who qualify. There's a, you know, a lot of ways you can qualify for this program. Uh, the current data we're seeing is that only about one in 10 eligible households is signing up for the uh, emergency broadband benefit. So that's a, you know, it's a, again, a 50 to $75 a month subsidy that can help people adopt broadband. And I really think that, that university extension can uh, let people know about this, help them through the sign up process. In fact, this morning, and I was getting on here today, I had one of our county educators call someone who was having difficulty with the, with the sign up process, help them walk through that, that process. It's not easy if you've never used the internet before. Um, so, uh, you know, this person was having difficulty and she actually got on the phone with him and helped him with it. Um, so I, that was, that's one way I think is definitely uh, would, would be good. The other way, uh, sorry to keep going here, but you know, the American Rescues Plan has funding for counties and some major cities. And I always, I tell our county educators, let them know that one way they can use this money is broadband and, and not just availability of broadband, but uh, increasing adoption as well. Um, and then Alexandra from the chat also has a question. What initiatives do you think would better impact access in schools? Well, so the schools is a relatively unique situation. Most of them do take advantage of E-rates so that they have access at the actual school itself. Um, you know, and we are seeing a little bit more of a shift towards allowing schools to provide hotspots to students. And in fact, there's a new program, the Emergency Connectivity Fund, that says now we're going to allow a school to provide access to the broader community. And so that's something I think uh, schools should look into, particularly if there's very bad access in, in a lot of in some of these rural communities. Um, so I think most schools all, are already taking advantage of E-rate, but I would love to see them expand their, their, what they're, who they're able to provide uh, broadband service to, including the, the surrounding community, which is what this, this ECF program is, is really geared towards. Thank you. We have one last question before we move on to our final presenter. Um, we hear from members in smaller or more rural communities that population retention is directly related to broadband access and adoption. How does that play into the larger conversation about economic development in rural areas? Absolutely. You know, a big, a big portion of, of economic development is having people there that can you know, develop. Um, and so we do have some, some older research now that does show exactly that point, showing that uh, migration decisions are driven by broadband availability. And I think there's going to be more work going into this, given what's happened with the COVID-19 and people potentially moving away from those dense urban areas into uh, kind of surrounding areas. Um, so absolutely, population change is a big, uh, you know, reason why we study broadband access. We're hoping to make a stronger case for that, but I would expect some more research to be, to be happening in that area shortly. Thank you so much, Dr. Whitaker. Again, if there are any questions we weren't able to ask, we'll circle back around to them at the end of this session. Um, we're moving along to Dr. Harrison, who's also researching about uh, rural connectivity, specifically as it relates to the Black community. Um, Dr. Dominique Harrison is the Director of Technology Policy at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, where she leads a program dedicated to exploring the impact of emerging technologies and developing policy solutions to improve the lives of Black communities. The program highlights urgent issues on platform accountability, broadband access and adoption, and privacy and algorithm fairness. Prior to joining the Joint Center, Dr. Harrison served as project director in the Aspen Digital Program at the Aspen Institute, where she conceived, developed, and led projects at the intersection of equity, technology, and public policy. She also worked at the United, excuse me, the United Nations Development Program in Washington, D.C.'s office and Internews. Her previous academic appointments include faculty and instructor positions at Howard University, the University of Texas at Austin, and Trinity Washington University. Dr. Harrison earned her bachelor's degree in advertising from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, an MA in media studies from the University of Texas at Austin, and a PhD in technology, policy, and society from Howard University. Her scholarship focuses on race, 
multi-stakeholder governance and communications policy. Dr. Harrison will discuss the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies recently issued issue brief, summarizing the challenges and solutions in expanding broadband in the Black rural South or Southern communities with populations that are 35% Black or higher. Thank you so much, Dr. Harrison, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Brittany Ray. I am going to start by sharing my screen. And I just wanna make sure everyone sees my presentation, but not my notes. Great, thanks. So um, as Brittany Ray said, uh, my name is Dr. Dominique Harrison and I am the Tech Policy uh, Director for the Joint Center. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm so excited to share um, some of the things that I've been working on as it relates to the Black Rural South. So today I'm gonna to specifically speak about our forthcoming report on expanding broadband um, in the Black Rural South with which, which will be available next week at jointcenter.org. Um, as Brittany Ray mentioned, I work at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, and we're known as America's Black Think Tank. We provide compelling and actionable policy solutions to eradicate persisting and evolving barriers to the full freedom of Black people in America. And our program is dedicated to exploring the impact of emerging technologies and developing policy solutions to improve the lives of Black communities. So I'm really excited to talk about the research um, in this reason that region that we define as the Black Rural South. To better understand the rural Black Belt, we looked at rural counties with populations that are 35% Black or higher. We collected this original data in order to isolate counties that were clearly part of the Black Rural South or Black Belt region to understand the region's distinctive characteristics relative to other parts of the nation. So using data from the American Community Survey five-year estimates, the Black Rural South includes 152 rural counties in 10 states with at least 35% or higher African-American population. The Joint Center's report, An Introduction to the Future of Work in the Black Rural South, is the first in a series of reports about the Black Rural South and the future of work, which you can find online on our website. African-Americans account for just over 13% of the U.S. population and 8% of the U.S. rural population. Approximately 3.2 million people live in the Black rural South, and African-Americans collectively make up 49.2% of the region's population and narrowly edge out whites as the largest racial group. I just wanted to point out that the same kind of um, intentional uh, uh, perspective um, and promotion that we give to other regions like Appalachia, that we should also give um, the same attention to the Black rural South because of those unique challenges and the great opportunities that exist in terms of broadband access and adoption. You know, lack of access to broadband is a problem in both metropolitan and rural areas, but efforts to close the digital divide often overlook the Black rural South. Too often, national broadband conversations focused on rural America conflate rural with white and point to racial disparities in broadband adoption as an affordability challenge facing Black residents of metropolitan areas. The discussions rarely give attention to the unique plight of Black Americans of rural counties. And for African Americans, lack of access to broadband is a problem in both metropolitan and rural areas. In the Black Rural South, 38% of African Americans lack home internet access. This is driven by both lack of affordability and availability of broadband services. The lack of broadband infrastructure magnifies the structural racism that African Americans' families experience in the Black Rural South. Expanding broadband could help reduce the deep racial and economic inequalities in education, jobs, and healthcare in the region. Affordability is a reason that Black families in the Black Rural South lack broadband. Nationally, affordability is one of the primary reasons that low-income Black families do not have broadband. The National Telecommunication and Information Administration suggests that 22% of all flying Black holds nationwide cited cost as a reason for not using broadband compared with 16% of their white counterparts. And the Pew Research Center estimates that nationwide, 44% of households with incomes under 35,000 lack broadband compared to only 
13% of those with incomes above 50,000 or above. So black households in the black rural South are much more likely to have lower incomes under 35,000 and thus are less likely to have broadband. And while we do not have survey data specifically for what was collected for our research on the extent to which affordability is the primary barrier to broadband um, access among black communities in the black rural South, other data sets suggest it is a significant factor. Even if broadband costs went down, many black families in the black rural South may still not be able to afford to pay for broadband services because they live in digital poverty or they do not have enough money for broadband services. Choosing to pay for broadband may mean deciding to pay for other utility bills or food. Again, a large percentage of African-Americans in the black rural South um, are less likely to have higher incomes. Lack of availability of broadband is another factor driving less access to broadband in the region. According to FCC data, internet service providers have failed to deploy broadband infrastructure at speeds of at least 25, three megabytes per second to a greater share of residents in the Black Rural South than other regions. The deployment of faster quality broadband infrastructure in concentrated in higher incomes areas also known as digital redlining, which facilitates economic and racial disparities. Microsoft collected data on the speeds of broadband uses from its cloud services in counties throughout the United States. So that means people using Microsoft tools such as Xbox or Microsoft Office. The data show that while 63.5% of all American households have broadband at speeds of at least 25.3, only 27.4% of Black Rural South households use broadband at these speeds. Broadband access could advance education and workforce training in the Black Rural South. Significant educational disparities persist, and the lack of high-speed broadband prevents Black students in the Black Rural South from completing assignments because they do not have reliable internet at home. Online learning and remote training could open up opportunities for students, workers, and teachers. Research suggests that students of color and students in rural communities are disproportionately affected by the digital divide. Black students throughout the entire rural South, including but not limited to the 152 counties in the Black rural South, are among those least likely to have broadband. 36% of Black students in the rural South do not have access to broadband services. Broadband access could create job opportunities. Unemployment is higher and labor force, labor force participation is lower in the Black rural South. Research published by Cornell University shows that expanding access to broadband contributes to greater employment gains in rural areas than in metro areas. And broadband can also support people working remotely, impede out migration, facilitate small business growth, and encourage talented people and businesses to stay in the region, as we just alluded to in Brian's um, presentation. Broadband access, access can also help improve health. From 2010 to 2018, states with Black rural South counties experienced some of the highest numbers of rural hospital closures. As hospitals close, telemedicine can connect rural patients to medical specials and specialty care not available in their community and also lower costs by diverting patients from expensive care settings. Broadband connectivity is a social determinant of health in the Black rural South. Broadband access alone will not completely solve all of these challenges, yet it is a critical component in starting to realize the opportunities to increase earnings, job growth, educational attainment, and healthcare in the Black rural South. And within the issue brief that was released about two weeks ago, along with the forthcoming 45-page report that goes into greater detail, we have promoted specific policy solutions to connecting more Black residents in the Black rural South to broadband services. The first is establishing a permanent and meaningful broadband benefit program for lower income households. We also say that we should require broadband providers that receive universal service funds to provide low income households and high cost area consumers with an affordable option. Federal broadband infrastructures should prioritize 
the Black rural South, as the challenges that I referenced today are very prominent and there are opportunities in connecting more residents to broadband services. When distributing recovery funds, Southern states should prioritize broadband expansion in Black rural South counties as well. There should be a task force that creates rules to prevent digital redlining. As has been said before, it is an issue as, that is occurring. There is a lack of data as, a result, as it relates to digital redlining in rural communities, but we know that the data shows that there is higher income areas that are getting faster quality broadband service than our lower income areas, which are um, you know, uh, populated by a large percentage of African-Americans. Prioritize federal funding for broadband projects developed by historically black colleges and universities. In the report, I really go into greater detail about the significance of HBCUs being anchor institutions for their surrounding communities, which um, have a large percent of, of African Americans, but also the kind of resources and brain trust power that HBCUs have in being able to understand the challenges of um, their surrounding communities and to be able to promote kind of solutions to help to ensure that uh, residents are getting the resources they need. And so um, I really talk about uh, the possibilities of HBCUs being more um, integrated into broadband services plans and, and, and providing more uh, availability for residents. Invest in research to understand challenges and to steadily improve broadband access. As it's been spoken about before, we need to understand folks who are truly unserved or underserved, right, to understand where the problem is. And the data is just not there in order to really paint a clear picture. We need to prohibit state governments from inhibiting local broadband networks. This is just another option in order to allow more competition um, within states, but also to help in drive down costs so that residents have more than one provider that they have to rely on. I think we, that we should update the federal definition of high-speed broadband, but we need to be careful that we don't uh, mark those who are, you know, underserved in terms of their populations don't have, um, all of them don't have access to 25.3 and they now become not served. And what ends up happening is that we push out those who don't have any broadband services, right? To have to compete for funding with larger communities who may have been at a 25.3 um, and, and in terms of applying for broadband monies. And lastly, we need to increase federal coordination and focus on the Black rural South. We've seen some action occurring with regards to this um, in terms of um, NTIA and USAC and um, the FCC, but we, there are over 50 uh, broadband funding programs across the federal government. And so there is much more coordination that needs to be um, developed in order to have uh, work towards the goals in which we seek um, to achieve, which includes getting more low-income households connected. So I'll stop there um, and take any questions. Again, looking forward to um, providing uh, and publishing our report that will come out next week. And um, thank you for the opportunity. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Dr. Harrison, and thank you for sharing information about your forthcoming report. And I uh, do apologize for mispronouncing your name after we discussed it yesterday with uh, Donique. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you. So in your report, you note that low-income households are disproportionately disconnected. In what ways does that hinder opportunities for economic growth for people already living at or below the poverty level? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we talk about just um, how much unemployment and how much children are living in poverty um, as it relates to Black residents in that area. And there are a lot of opportunities um, in terms of providing broadband services that can help increase the opportunity for employ employment. I mean, even being able to work from home, right, with broadband services remotely. I think we learned that if you don't have internet at home, you're not able to do that, those kinds of things. And so there are a lot of opportunities in terms of job growth. There are several research conducted by Deloitte um, and other companies that show that broadband services is connected to um, job growth. 
um, and can provide the opportunity for also black businesses to stay in the area, but also to grow because they're able to connect with, um, uh, you know, uh, buyers across the world or just able to function as a, uh, a business within the region because they have those kinds of services. So I think there's a lot of opportunities in the area um, to increase um, the, ec the economic vitality of this region if given the opportunity for more services as it relates to Barbara. Thank you. And I know in your report, I mean, you just mentioned that in your report, you go into depth about how HBCUs could, as anchor institutions, could really um, help to expand broadband access and adoption. Are there current examples of institutions that you highlight that are already doing this work? Within the report, I don't highlight specific um, HBCUs, but I will tell you that I'm really excited about um, the uh, program at the NTIA, NTIA, which is providing a lot of funding to HBCUs to carry out these current projects. And one of the things that I do bring up is that we really need to see um, HBCUs as well as um, nonprofits who want to partner with HBCUs to provide broadband services, more case studies to understand the kinds of partnerships that are and can be successful so that people understand the kinds of resources they can be using in their um, community, but also some um, to understand the kind of capacity that they might need to carry out such a, such a project. And so while I don't have specific universities um, that I can speak to, um, there are a number that have worked um, as it relates to providing more broadband services for their surrounding communities. And NTIA, if I'm not mistaken, may have uh, some of that research online. Thank you. And just one last question here before we do open it up to the entire group to ask questions of each other. Um, Expanding rural broadband is an issue that gets an overwhelming amount of bipartisan support and it's treating as a funding priority. Why aren't those resources expanding broadband opportunities for communities of color in the rural South? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, and you know, the purpose of this research was to say that again, you know, black folks in metropolitan and rural areas face this issue as it relates to availability and affordability of service. And so we really wanted to highlight the unique challenges of African-Americans um, in the black rural South region as we defined it. You know, I would say that there just needs to be, I think more data to explain what is going on in the area. Um, I think that we need to promote um, or highlight, excuse me, the concerns and challenges um, for people of color in those regions. Um, and that starts by having some good, credible data that you can use to work off to say that this is what is happening. And that's where we started from. And so really what we're saying is that um, we want policymakers and we want organizations and state and local governments to understand that there is something unique happening here. Um, and in order to be more intentional and targeted about how we use the funding or the programs that we develop to connect these communities, we need to understand those problems. And so I would encourage more research that really gets down to the specifics as it relates to what's going on with Hispanics in rural communities, what's going on to indigenous people in rural communities, Asian communities in these um, rural communities. And so that will help paint a more fuller picture about um, broadband access around the US. Thank you so much, Dr. Harrison. Um, do you wanna just highlight again, the forthcoming reports coming out next week, you said? Yes, uh, so we'll be sure to share that on our networks. I mean, I do wanna open the floor, a huge part of academic research is collaborating with your peers. So I wanna open the floor for everyone that's participated on today's, uh, in today's session to ask questions of each other. And there's no, there's no order for asking questions. Whoever wants to go first can just raise your hand and go first. Yes, Dr. Ryan Smith. Um, so thank you so much, Brittany Ray. Uh, so oh, I'm getting a little bit of a feedback uh, echo here, sorry. Um, so I actually wanted to ask a question of um, Dara and uh, really loved hearing about your work and your research. And I was curious to know, 
you know, how we can incorporate more uh, stories, particularly from indigenous communities, um, from native folks like yourself, you know, the story about the thunder beings um, around communication through waves. I mean, these perspectives, the, the perspectives that you're sharing from your community, from, you know, your um from your community seem so important in helping us to rethink how we think about broadband policy. So I was just wondering if you could elaborate or say a little bit more about, you know, how how we can do more of that in terms of learning to listen in new ways and how that might actually work to inform policy. Hmm. That's such a great question, Colin. I really appreciate that question. Um, <clears throat> a couple of things just ping in my mind right away. One is the conversation that we're kind of being led into right now about boarding schools and the mass loss of language in our communities. Um, so much of an indigenous worldview is rooted in language. And it's, you know, just the way that we say things, the way that we compare things, the humor, and um, just, and it's an understanding, a way of understanding that the English language isn't capable of capturing or relaying. And so um, as we're talking about language revitalization, I think we're also having this conversation about the revitalization of these ideas and this worldview and this lens that we're looking, that we're looking through the, uh, to see the world. And um, so the language revitalization is a big part of what you're talking about and um, having people who can share that. Um, and then um, talking to elders, having conversations with the elders, that's who said uh, about the thunder beings, it was um, elders from the, uh, from the Great Lakes region. And um, so, yeah, a lot of it is inviting people, not just me, but people who are indigenous also to conversations like this, um, which is huge. And, and it's another reason why I'm so thankful to be here because we have been excluded from these conversations for so long. And so just by being here and being able to represent and bring that, that worldview is um, so important. So um, I hope that answers your question. It's kind of all over the place, but uh, you know, it, you said it best yourself, really just listening, being a part of the conversation, following Indigenous people, listening to Indigenous scholars, these little bits come up just naturally, uh, because there's so much Indigenous brilliance in the world. And as you plug into it, you'll start to understand it too. Thank you. I have a, I have a question for Colin, actually, if that's okay. <laughs> sure thing. <laughs> So Colin, given that there's all this new kind of renewed interest in funding available for digital inclusion, what would you recommend people who have an interest in this topic, but might not have been historically involved with a digital inclusion organization? How can they start to build on this, this uh, momentum that's going forward? What would, what would your suggestions be? Yeah, thanks so much, Brian. Um, and I should just also take a moment to say that I've uh, really enjoyed working with you over the years and learning a lot from from your own research. And you know, I think that's one of the one of the reasons why I was trying to highlight ecosystems. And I think that is provides a lot of opportunity to um, allow people to say, "How do I plug in?" Right, and also to realize that there are lots of different ways to plug in and to listen most importantly, listen to folks who have been disenfranchised, who have been left out of the conversation in ways that Dara is talking about. Um, and I think looking, that's why I think the framework moving from deficits to assets, I think has just really informed me that comes out of community development work. I think that is uh, just a great way for folks and communities to say that if we organize with other people in our communities, there's likely someone that's thinking about this issue, particularly now because of COVID-19, you know, so many, practically everyone was impacted, right, by this, that, um, you know, I think that reaching out, making it, carving out space and, and people's schedules often don't have time for this work, but making it a priority and saying, who else cares about this issue in my community likely is the first start towards finding the folks to have those deeper conversations in ways that we've been talking about today. I think that's one, uh, that's one answer that can lead to organizing around the federal policy funding and bringing it into communities. 
I have a comment and a question. Um, my comment is for Dominique that uh, your your whole presentation is inspirational and your organization and just your policy recommendations are amazing. And I can't wait to see your report because I'm sure it's going to be just as great. Um, and then I have a question for Mike, which is uh, what question were you trying to answer when you realized that uh, data was the problem? Um, great question. And I, you know, I, so I built up, I had started building up um, data sets about, about the digital divide and I, I was kind of building it and building it and, and realize, and, you know, very quickly realizing that the adoption and inclusion data is, uh, is not often enough part of the, the conversation. So you kind of start with the FCC's data and, and it, it's really cool. It's at the census block level, it's so local. Um, but, it, but as you start to learn more about the, what, what data it is, you, you kind of learn that you're, you're not seeing what you think you're seeing. And so I, um, I, start, I started to build in the, the ACS data. And at, at some point in there, I, you know, things weren't, weren't adding up between, um, you know, between different data sets. And, and I think, uh, it was, I forget whether it was like the New York Times or, or NTIA or some, somebody who's trying to make this great point about, about broadband adoption and they, they could have made an even stronger point if they, if they had used the, the ACS data that was, you know, core broadband. And so, so that's what kind of got me kind of digging further and further into that. Well, thank you all so much for your time. And I want to thank everyone that's joined us today. Um, this has been truly an enlightening session. And I hope that this is just the first of many academic pre-conferences or conferences that we have that focus specifically on the broadband research that's being done in this field, because obviously we have so many voices that we need to hear from that should be informing the policy decisions that are made. Um, I do encourage everyone to continue with the conversation tomorrow at noon as we begin day two of our conference. Um, you can find out more information about our conference at nextcenturycities.org forward slash conference. Uh, we will be sharing information that we shared today on our website. Um, and please keep up with the conversation online using the hashtags, hashtag broadband is power and hashtag nccon21. Thank you all again for your time. Um, and please do continue to keep up with the conversation. Everyone have a great afternoon.